sábado 23 de marzo, vamos a presentar la Conferencia Internacional de Nanotecnología e Higiene Ocupacional. Esta conferencia está organizada por eh, la Escuela Profesional de Higiene y Seguridad Industrial, la Organización de Estudiantes de Ingeniería de Higiene y Seguridad Industrial, también por la Asociación Peruana de la Asociación Peruana de Higienistas Ocupacionales, el APEO, y también pues, vamos a contar con eh, la participación de Oste. En este caso, pues, vamos a presentar a la Magíster Amparo Becerra Pauca, directora del EPICI, el ingeniero Gregory Galicio, presidente de la Asociación Peruana de Higienistas Ocupacionales, el señor Berry Díaz, presidente de la Asociación de Ingeniería de Higiene y Seguridad Industrial, el PhD Peter Pitti, director técnico del Laboratorio de Higiene Ocupacional, OSTECH, el conferencista y conferencista internacional. También tenemos el agrado de nuestros invitados, el ingeniero David Santos, gerente del Laboratorio OSTECH. Y también tenemos el agrado de presentar a Cristina Orosa, que va a ser nuestra traductora para el conferencista internacional. En este caso... Eh, vamos a presentar primero con las palabras y la participación de cada uno de nuestros miembros de la mesa de honor. Para eso vamos a tener las palabras de, primero de la ingeniera Amparo Becerra, directora de Letiz. Muchas gracias, amiga. Y muy buenos días con todos. Muy buenos días, miembros de la mesa de honor. Es un agrado para mí recibir a tan importantes profesionales como es el PLP, Peter PLP, que viene de Canadá junto con el ingeniero David Santos, ambos de la empresa Ostech en Canadá, y que vienen laborando de manera muy vinculada con la Asociación Peruana de Higiene Ocupacional, representada por el ingeniero Gregor Galicio, que está presente, y realmente este evento ha sido posible eh, gracias a la Asociación Peruana de Higiene Ocupacional, que nos ha permitido contar con tan brillantes profesionales. De igual manera, eh, la organización, eh, yo como directora de la Escuela Profesional de Ingeniería de Higiene y Seguridad Industrial, la, la estoy dirigiendo, pero ha sido también eh, muy grato contar con el gran apoyo de la Asociación de Estudiantes de Ingeniería de Higiene y Seguridad Industrial, y acá está Mieri, eh, que la representa, y, y, y también agradecer a la doctora Cristina Osora. Gracias a ella vamos a tener la traducción a este tan importante mensaje. Yo quería solamente muy brevemente decir, eh, ya desde ya, a felicitarlos a todos, a toda esta distinguida concurrencia, luego profesionales, avisados y también estudiantes, por interesarse en tan importante tema, porque los, los, los ingenieros de higiene y seguridad industrial también tenemos que modernizarnos y con mucho orgullo. Puedo decir que actualmente también la facultad y la formación misma de la carrera sí contamos con un curso de tecnología de materiales de seguridad que nos han llevado, lo saben, ¿no? Y aquí yo veo dentro del curso temas, la misma nanotecnología, átomos, neuronas, genes, aplicaciones en seguridad, ¿no? Y también aplicaciones en higiene. Se hablaba, yo sí recuerdo que se hablaban de las telas por ejemplo, ¿no? ahora el mundo, la era de la transformación, donde hasta chips pequeños se instalan en, en el ser humano, ¿no? pero vamos a ver los alcances, sobre todo estos alcances que hay en el higiene industrial, y eso va a ser posible con esta conferencia. Yo los exhorto a aprovechar el mensaje que nos va a dar nuestro sentido PSD, el Peter Pitín, en este momento. Entonces, nuevamente bienvenida a esta casa de estudios, aprovechémoslo todo y nuevamente gracias, bienvenida. Cedo la palabra entonces, amiga, ahí lo va a decir. Listo, muchas gracias directora. Bueno, ahora vamos a pasar a las palabras del ingeniero Gregory Galicio, que es el presidente de la PEO. Y 
gracias, Abby. Muy buenos días con todos, el público asistente. Para mí, verdaderamente es un honor eh, estar aquí en esta, en esta mesa en representación de todos los estudiantes de Ingeniería de Higiene y Seguridad Industrial. Y me alegra mucho ver caras de la especialidad en esta charla, en esta conferencia internacional que se va a dar. Eh, hemos venido trabajando en conjunto, como lo mencionó el ingeniero Amparo, con la escuela y con la APEO y se pudo dar esta charla, esta conferencia. Eh, esperemos que sea de provecho para todos ustedes y en aras de fomentar más este tipo de conferencias internacionales, eh, le pediría el, el seguir trabajando juntos en relación con la apego y con la escuela, porque esto es un inicio y como escuela, como especialidad lo necesitamos y esperamos contar también con el apoyo del ingeniero Gregory Galicio y demás instituciones ¿no? que, se nos puedan, que nos puedan sumar. Eh, tenemos distintos representantes eh, egresados de nuestra especialidad que están en, en instituciones, liderando instituciones importantes y me gustaría que se sumen. De parte de la ESI estamos con las puertas abiertas de trabajar con cualquier organización afín a la especialidad que sea liderada por egresados o por gente o por especialistas de otras carreras profesionales. Eh, sin nada más que decir, esperamos que sea de provecho de todos los alumnos, egresados y público asistente. Gracias. y éramos en los años 50 eh, los primeros higienistas ocupacionales de Latinoamérica. Eh, perdimos esa posición, pero la Asociación Peruana de Higiene Ocupacional y los higienistas que estamos en conjunto con ellos, nos hemos tomado eh, como objetivo principal acercarnos a la eh, mayor línea de conocimientos en higiene ocupacional. Exhorto a ustedes a... Uh, a que esta barrera que tenemos hoy día, que se muestra, por ejemplo, que es el uso de los headphones, no sea dentro de unos 10 años una barrera. Los conocimientos generalmente en higiene ocupacional están más o menos entre 30 años avanzados, pero en el idioma inglés. Entonces, eh, esa es la primera barrera que deberíamos vencer. ¿no? La segunda barrera es la certificación. Deberíamos tener higienistas certificados acá en Perú. Por ejemplo, Brasil tiene solamente cuatro. Argentina tiene solamente uno, en Perú no hay ninguno, a pesar de que hay muchos profesionales que se desarrollan y que tienen niveles muy altos, en, eh, y principalmente por las minas. ¿no? Eh, para mí es un sueño cumplido eh, ver tantos higienistas, a comparación de cuando yo era estudiante en el 2006 y solamente éramos, eh, como estudiantes aspirantes a higiene, solamente dos. Eh, he luchado y he encontrado en el camino a personas que tienen los mismos ideales que mi persona para formar una gran, eh, este, un, un gran grupo de higienistas en Perú que puedan satisfacer la demanda eh, de todo el país. Y en ese camino, viajando por, por Latinoamérica, eh, en Brasil, Argentina, Venezuela y incluso en Perú, hemos encontrado gente de otros países del mundo que es igual que nosotros. Uno de ellos es Peter Pitín, otro David Santos, a los cuales les, les agradezco profundamente de que tengan los mismos ideales de formación desinteresada de higienistas en Perú. Eh, les, les doy un abrazo muy grande. De verdad, es lo mejor que podemos dar de nosotros. Muchas gracias, Peter. Muchas gracias, David. Well, thank you for 
first of all, uh, I like to start this presentation working backwards. Uh, usually, you thank everyone at the end of your presentation, and for me, I want to start so I don't forget. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the University at Apeho for inviting me here. Uh, and uh, I would like to really thank all of you for coming this morning. Th this is a Saturday morning. You're supposed to be at home relaxing, but you've chosen to be here. And for me, that's... that's uh, an indication uh, that you are interested in hygiene. And uh, if I can impart a little bit of information this morning, that's all I hope to do. As hygienists, a lot of this information you will already know. And it's not in the presentation that you will learn anything necessarily but it may be later on in our dialogue and conversation. So what I will try to do is control my pace of uh, conversation. And if you want to follow in English, uh, let me know if I, if I go too fast. And finally, and I'd like to thank Christina for for doing the uh, translation course. Okay, so we'll get started on this subject. So, as you saw, it's a little bit backwards here. Yes, the the uh, the title that I put to this is really about awareness of nanoparticles. And in, in terms of in terms of hygienists, I our our three key words uh, in our practice are recognition, evaluation, and control of hazardous uh, situations, conditions, and agents. Uh, so I like to preface that by in advance of identification or recognition, we need to have anticipation. And this is the area in which we are uh, dealing with nanoparticles at the present time. Because it's unlikely that we will actually, many of us uh, will uh, encounter uh, nanoparticle exposures uh, directly uh, in, in, in the work environment. But there are secondary exposures that we'll talk about. And, and uh, so, so let us think about this uh, presentation in terms of whetting your appetite for uh, this information and, uh, and uh, being aware of where nanoparticle exposures might occur. Okay, so what I would like to do here is just give you an indication of what we want to do in this uh, presentation. Uh, so the first uh, part of this is we, I want to talk about uh, nanoparticles and I will uh, just refer to the definition of nanoparticles. It's always important to establish a baseline. Uh, there is, uh, the, in a nanoparticle area, we find that there is a, people are not necessarily speaking the same language uh, when they refer to nanoparticles. And so uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about nanoparticles and how we differentiate the ultrafine particles from what we call the engineered or, or nanoparticles. And uh, secondly, then I will talk about these differences and what the significance is. I'll, I'll, I'll touch base on then where we're going to find exposures to nanoparticles in the work environment, uh, in the cons consumer and the environment. Uh, those will be our considerations. And then we'll look a little bit at um, nanoparticles in the airways and what happens to nanoparticles when they gain entrance to the lungs. 
uh, what what we know, what we don't know about the toxicology, uh, about the movement of nanoparticles uh, in in the body, and uh, finally uh, 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 we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we might anticipate the effects to be, uh, if we, because there's much of this that we do not know. Uh, and so what can we speculate on reasonably and uh, what what don't we know? So we'll look at a little bit of that. Uh, uh, so that's what we want to cover here. And finally, as uh, you saw that last point, I put it in there, whether we get to it or not, it's, uh, it's a little bit of sample, right? As hygienists, everybody loves to sample. So we may talk about it sampling as applied to uh, nanotechnology. So, so, yes, so let's talk about nanoparticles. In, in the, uh, in the um, popular definition, in the formal definition of nanoparticles, we are referring to particles of nanometer size. Nanometer size particles. So we're talking about superfine or ultrafine particles. That means uh, particles, a nanometer is one thousandth of a micron. And in hygiene, we often deal in particle sizes in the micron range. So now we're talking about particles that are super small, way down. Yeah, yeah, an another order of magnitude small. Those are the nanoparticles. And so when people talk about nanoparticles, they often refer to ultrafine particles uh, as, and they lump all particles together. But there is another um, more uh, popular definition for, for nanoparticles, and this refers to engineered particles. These are not naturally occurring particles but are specially designed particles that are less than 0.1 micron or 100 nanometers. And that, that, that uh, classification is actually arbitrary. Some people put it at approximately 200 nanometers. So it's not important. What, uh, what is important is that nanoparticles, to some people, when you're talking about nanoparticles, we are talking about engineered particles. So just to put it into, into our frame of reference, which we're very familiar with, most of us, and here's, I've, I've shown a, a scale which has got no dimension on it other than here's the, the micron in the middle, the millimeter, and the nanometer. So nanometer particles are in the order of 10 to the minus 9 of a meter, as opposed to a micrometer, which is, our micron, which is uh, 10 to the minus 6. So it's in this range that we're talking about. And in relation, so in relation to uh, um, particles that we concern ourselves about, uh, we have seen a new convention, of course, in hygiene, uh, in which we're interested in all inhalable particles. And, all, and so this takes us up to the large range of approximately two, 200 microns, which is now, you're talking about particles that are measurable that you can actually feel or see, right? Um, those, this is the, the broad range of uh, particles in uh, that we are concerned ourselves with in hygiene primarily. Uh, so, so that's one one aspect to this that we have to uh, remember when we talk about nanoparticles. There's, there's two elements. One is the size of the particles, and the other is the implication that there is a structure or a design to the particles. So I just to try to better illustrate this for you, I put, I've tried to separate out on the left hand side of the panel here the ultrafine particles, and on the right side uh, what we refer to as the engineered nanoparticles. 
And so these are, on the left side, uh, we're, you'll, you'll see uh, uh, different processes that generate nanoparticles. Uh, these, are these are ones that you're certainly familiar with as high genus, uh, in which welding and soldering produce very fine particles. Not all of the, in fact, a lot of the particles in welding and soldering are very large particles. Uh, in, in the micron range, but there are some ultra particles uh, that are generated by these kinds of processes. Combustion, for example, you can refer to that uh, in uh, environmental pollution, uh, like uh, the uh, uh, exhaust, the diesel exhaust. Uh, uh, that some of these are uh, 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 ultra fine particles generated by by uh, engines or forest fires producing naturally occurring uh, ultrafine particles. And those particles, uh, I've overlaid here a couple of images, and these are microscopy images, just to give you an indication that when we talk about ultrafine particles, these are largely particles without structure. Uh, they are they can be different shapes, but the, the population of particles is often very uh, diverse, uh, ranging in all kinds of different sizes. On, on the right side, you can contrast that against what we um, are talking about in terms of engineer particles. And in the, in the engineer particles, there are um, things like uh, we refer to as super small particles that are quantum dots, nanotubules, uh, uh, nano, uh, nanostructures. And we will, in this presentation, we will touch base on, on these ones. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to flip through a couple of slides here. Uh, so this is, for example, the type of particle that we're talking about, which you can see is drastically different than the... Uh, particles that are ultrafine particles that are generated uh, by uh, in, un unintentionally as byproducts of uh, industrial processes or, or forest fires or, or uh, in the, uh, pollutants. Uh, this, for example, is a, a, a C60 full fullerene. Uh, and, uh, or maybe it is, maybe it isn't actually. I want to mention that that uh, we actually have a nanoparticle. I'm not a nanoparticle, actually. Okay. but we do have one in the room, and that's David. <laughs> so, so later on, when we get to questions about how they're manufactured, uh, David actually made nanoparticles. He's been involved in the manufacture of them, and he knows a lot about analyzing them and capturing them and so, in some ways, I'm just the mouthpiece, but he's the expert. Okay, so, so, so this is just a sample of, of, of the kind of structure we're talking about. Here's another one, uh, another particle that's kind of a spherical particle, uh, and uh, for example, it might be designed for medicinal application. Uh, and, and this would be a tubule, what they refer to as a nanotubule. Uh, that might be used as a carrier for, uh, for transporting uh, medicine. Uh, so a new design um, of uh, technology for application to medicine. This is what I want to focus on, though, is this slide a little bit. So this helps us put into perspective nanoparticles. Imagine, imagine that, uh, that uh, I think most of you have your pen, and if you put that dot on the pen, right? And if you divide that tiny dot uh, into about a million separate dots, now we're talking nanoparticle size. So it's taking that dot, dividing it by one million times, and now we're down to the nanoparticle sizes. Okay? So this is, this is, this is what we're talking about. But we're also talking about particles that are of this size, that are, have been engineered. They're not random. They're not. Uh, they're not uh, um, simply reduction fragments uh, broken apart from other from parent material. These are actually designed to suit a purpose. 
So, and on this scale here, I've also populated it with a little bit of other information. This, by the way, of course, is not my, not my uh, uh, photo. It, uh, it comes from uh, particle sciences, but uh, I've adapted it here to help illustrate uh, the point here. So, what you, uh, what we want to know is, uh, is uh, the range of nanoparticle sizes. I've, I've shown here uh, is, uh, is down from about one to, I say, 100 or 200, depending on who you're talking to, uh, is the range of nanoparticle sizes. And in that range, what, what you see up here, we see that nanoparticles are smaller than viruses. They're, 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 uh, they're, uh, and at the very small size, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're the size of DNA strands. And this, you'll see later on in the presentation, has some really uh, significant uh, implications in terms of what, uh, what nanoparticles can do because uh, our traditional understanding of toxicology may, um, it, it may challenge us uh, somewhat here uh, when, when we, when we uh, look at these engineered particles. Uh, normally in a hygiene, and what, we're, what we are often dealing with is particles that are, that I've, I've marked it here as 25 microns, because 25 microns is that kind of magic, magic area where, uh, where uh, particles are uh, respirable. Above that, they're, they're, uh, they're um, certainly, you can inhale them, but they're not going to, when they get too large, they actually don't go too far into the lungs. They always stop in the nose or maybe they, you know, the top of the windpipe. Um, but uh, so it, our traditional hygiene area has been focused in this, in this range. Uh, and uh, um, so nanoparticles takes us down to a whole new, a whole new level, right? And and so. What we've normally been dealing with is are um, things like um, things that we can see, are, are like pollens in the air, and they they're around the limits of resolution of our eye, and and anything smaller than that is actually now the stuff that is really of interest to us is high genes. Uh The stuff that's floating in the air is usually around 25 microns somewhere in there, and, that, and beyond that, uh, as you go down. Now we're starting to get to the stuff that can penetrate deeper into the lung that can cause issues. Uh, so, so that just gives you a, a kind of an overlay of the uh, of the size aspect to nanoparticles. And and uh, uh, so yeah, so if we can we can just move on. Yeah, so this size and I. And I I'm sorry, I, I hope you can read that. I'm not sure if you can read that. Uh, but um, the, the fact that these particles are very, very small has some important implications uh, in terms of what they can do when uh, they enter the body. So one of the first things is that they have much greater surface area. Imagine you, got, uh, you divide that uh, little, that little part, um, that little uh, comma by one million times, right? So now you have one million tiny little spheres. The surface area of one million tiny little spheres is enormous. And what what that what that means is that these particles can be far more reactive when they when they actually get uh, when they deposit in in the body. Uh, the the second uh, implication of, uh, of the nanoparticle size is that uh, because they're engineered, they can be engineered to have more of the uh, atoms on the surface of, of the particle, which means that that can influence how they bind to tissue or how they, uh, how they interact uh, in the dynamics. And as I mentioned, this was a point I wanted to reinforce, which is that nanoparticles are the same size as DNA proteins. They're smaller than viruses. So, so 
so what that uh, what that means is that there are there are interactions with cells at a different level, at the molecular level, and that uh, that uh, uh, the particles actually are small enough to go across the membranes, uh, which is a big concern for us, so they can directly penetrate uh, into the into the circulation, or if they're deposited. In the nose, one of our one of our big concerns is the ones that deposit up here because it's a very short pathway to the brain. Uh, so, so these are these are the things that uh, are, are concerned to us, and that, and that is why the small size is something that uh, is of, you know considerable interest uh, for us. Now, as I say, what is it, some of the important things that we have to take away? The significance, uh, in addition. To talking about uh, the, the the particle, uh, the, the size of the particles, and, and the talk, uh, the speculation that we just referred to. Our problem as hygienists is that the laws of we, all of our laws of particle behavior have been, and and our understanding of uh, dosimetry. Have been based on micron-sized particles, and now we're going down uh, an order, of, well, three orders of magnitude to, to superfine particles, ultra-fine, nanoparticles. And um, so, in terms of our predictability, we are somewhat handicapped. We're not able to necessarily translate directly from micron-sized particles of the same composition to nano-sized particles. And, and so the point here is that the nanoparticle properties uh, can be completely different, completely different from the parent material that they originated from. And this is in part why we don't have really good toxicological information. Uh, second of all, why, and this is one of the reasons where uh, there's such an interest in, of course, in um, nanoparticles and nanomaterials, is, is that they often have really unique uh, qualities, characteristics, uh, that we're, of course, exploiting for commercial purposes, but there are things like uh, unusual electrical properties, uh, the chemical properties are different than the parent material, the magnetic properties, and, and so on. And one of the things that we're going to talk about here is that the nanoparticle size influences, of course, in, in kind of summarizing this together, is it influences the, the dose, to the to the dose to the uh, to the uh, individual where the particles are deposited in the lungs and also their distribution around the body. So let's just talk a little. Uh, one second, a little while. I do a lot of talking at home too. <laughs> okay, so let's let's just pick up on this on this um, uh, talking about. Um, and, and again, as hygienists, I'm probably this is just reinforcing the stuff that you've uh, that you uh, have seen in your uh, in your lectures. Uh, it actually goes back to some of my my background as well as in uh, is in the uh, inhalation particle toxicology uh, area. And that's how I come to this subject. Um, but as I said, I'm not as expert as David is. <laughs> Uh, so let's just talk about uh, when you inhale particles. Uh, the, 
the, the effects of those inhaled particles because they're, they're determined by where the particles uh, settle in the lungs or deposit in the lungs. Uh, they're determined, uh, the effects are determined by um, how the lung deals with the uh, particles. Uh, the lung, uh, the lung of the lungs uh, have uh, very good defenses. Uh, and in fact, it, it's important to realize that, uh, that uh, the reason we, we don't actually get uh, sick uh, often is because of the defenses. If you were to consider the quality of the air uh, in, in this, you know, in this room, uh, there would there would be uh, there would be at least at least my guess my guess in the order of uh, t maybe 10 million respirable particles uh, per cubic meter of air. Uh, many of them uh, that that uh, um, many of them would actually be all kinds of nasty stuff. Right, that, that uh, they're from the environment, contaminants. Some of them could be allergens or fragments of, uh, of let's say, uh, of uh, insects or, or, or you know, uh, cell, cell fragments, uh, things like that. that it's in the air all the time. Uh, and even in even in a, in an operating room where they scrub the air, uh, that air you think is so pure. Uh, it still has a, maybe a, the best class of air, still going to have a hundred thousand particles per cubic meter of air. Uh, so, so the reason we don't get sick is because the lungs have tremendous defenses and they protect us all the time, right? So, and this, so this leads us to some concerns, of course, on how they're going to handle nanoparticles. Uh, so, but, but, so the site of deposition, the clearance, and also the particle properties are some of the other things that we are uh, that we talked about in terms of what are these things going to do uh, to people when they when they when they're exposed to nanoparticles. So, yeah, so we'll explore them a little bit here, and this is just um, this is just a um, actually this is a, I apologize for this. Uh, this slide, I I took a picture of, I have a big poster like this, and I adapted it for this purpose, I only because I like the poster, and uh, and so uh, there are things on here that you don't, you know, that you probably uh, don't uh, don't need to refer to, uh, but uh, uh, so so in terms of in terms of talking about particle deposition in the lungs, we need to first of all refer to the, to the anatomy of the lungs or the structure of the lungs. And uh, the, the lungs, uh, are often, we often refer to them as the, uh, uh, the uh, bron bronchial tree, because it's a tree structure. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the, the lungs are very much like, like, a, like a, one of these trees outside where you have a trunk, and then the trunks break out into branches, and the branches break out into smaller branches, and then ultimately into leaves. And it's actually in the leaves that the respiration, that respiration occurs. And, and that's the same thing uh, in the lungs, only it's, take that, take that structure, turn it upside down. And now you've got the trunk here. The air comes in uh, through the main windpipe we call the trachea, or trachea. Uh, and then that airway splits into two airways. Sometimes, it, and then it will continue to split on and on and on. Uh, sometimes it splits two times, sometimes three times. But it goes through maybe 25 generations of this uh, uh, splitting. Ultimately, the airways end up in these <coughs> fine structures we call alveoli, which is the gas exchange, the respiration, the leaves. Uh, and this is where this is really the purpose of the lung, of the lungs, is to exchange gas. Right? So, 
we, we take in oxygen, we dump out carbon dioxide. And what happens in this, in this, um, this tremendous transition occurs all through the airways. Uh, so as we go down from the very large airways, uh, we have the tissue that makes those airways is different. Uh, they're and, and important in terms of particle deposition, uh, velocities, air velocities. We have really high air. Imagine you're taking uh, a liter of, it's, a, it's actually not a liter, it's about three quarters of a liter of air, and inhaling it through a tiny little pipe like this. Uh, and and uh, that's in, in one breath, or it's actually half a breath, because the other half is exhausting the air, right? On the intake, you're, 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 uh, it's about half of the breath. And you do this 12 to 15 times a minute. So the actual velocity of the air going through these pipes is quite high to force this air in. Um, so, so there's transition as we go down from here to here to here to here after 25 generations. Completely different makeup of the uh, of the cells, of the structure. These ones have muscle, these ones have nothing like that. These ones have uh, um, uh, all of the uh, all of the um, blood vessels running through there, the fine blood vessels. And, and so what happens is that as we go down, we of course, what do we do? We increase the surface area. Uh, and, and this is a very important um, part I'll come back to in a moment. Um, but what happens is after 25 generations is, as I said, we have a large increase in the surface area. Uh, and these structures here, the alveoli, when particles deposit deep down in there, they stay longer. And the mechanics, the mechanism that they use to remove particles, is different than the mechanism that is used up here. Up in these bigger airways, we have uh, th we have the escalator, the mucociliary uh, room. It's a room, right? It works, sweeps the uh, sweeps the particles out of the water. Uh, down here, that that doesn't exist. But we do have other other uh, defense mechanisms that scavengers that go in and and neutralize them. So the elimination mechanisms, it's not only, it's not only when particles de deposit uh, in here, but it's how long they stay is in the lungs that it has an important influence on, on their, uh, potential influence on their, on their toxic effects. The other thing that is becoming increasingly interesting and uh, important and, and uh, is is the what we refer to as the microbiome, and that is the population, the population of microbes that exist in all of these areas. Uh, the the microbes serve to protect. We are we're, we're completely populated with microbes all the time, inside, outside, and we just want the good ones to be there. So they protect us from the bad ones, right? Because if we take the good ones away, the bad guys are going to come in. And, and so what happens is there's also potential in the nanoparticle area to uh, to influence the human microbiome. And microbiome is an important part of our immunology and defense. I, I um, was at a the American Allergy Conference uh, two weeks ago, and it, it's it's a, it's a big topic, uh, uh, and increasingly all the time this topic about my, microbiome. Okay, so I, I said I would come back to this uh, this um, um, reference to the surface area of the uh, gas exchange. So after 25 different, uh, tw let's say, it may be. Each path can be a different length. So it might be, in some cases, 23, 23 generations, some cases 27, 28, and that's not important. What is important is that the surface area of all, this gas exchange uh, region of the lungs, they say, is about the size of a tennis court. So if you lay the lungs of 
I'll flatten the surface area. But gas exchange, you've got something about the size of a, of a tennis court. And, and so what this does is it, uh, so you have now a flat area that is uh, uh, the interface uh, between air and on the other side, you've got the wall of blood. So this kind of is very, very efficient for transferring, for transferring uh, oxygen uh, and, and, uh, and, which, and, and getting uh, rid of the carbon dioxide. But that also has implications again in terms of where the particles go. What, what, yeah. oh. I guess it's a water break. as far as the, for those of you who want to follow, is it okay? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, now from a hygiene perspective, um, what we want to know is that um, there's different mechanics that occur, different mechanisms that make the particles uh, deposit in the lungs. Some of them don't actually, right? And many of them you breathe in and you breathe back out. Uh, so in the large airways, the, the um, mechanism that really operates is based on the air velocity, and this is impaction. That's, uh, impaction is where the particles, uh, when the air moves around, going into the smaller branch and into the smaller branch each turn, uh, the air can navigate the turn, but the particle can't. It's, it's, it's a bit like... Um, uh, driving in your car and you get the the uh, bug that hits your windscreen, you know, it hits your windshield because the air can, the car can split the air, but uh, unfortunately the little bug can't, <laughs> can't, can't get past, can't navigate the, uh, the obstruction of the car coming at it and so it impacts on you. And the same thing happens with these high velocities is the particles will impact on the, on the air. Uh, as we go a little bit deeper, the air velocities drop, drop uh, as we approach the deeper into the lungs towards the gas exchange, towards the alveoli, and that allows time for the particles that are uh, large enough to fall out of suspension, just to sediment, to fall. And that's a gravity-driven mechanism. And, and then in the, in the gas exchange regions, uh, this is where the predominant mechanism is diffusion. And that is, that is driven, uh, that's a time dependent mechanism, you, uh, which means that the particles there are simply small enough to have navigated, and it, they, they're now actually bombarded by the air molecules, and it's the air molecules that drive the diffusion process, whether they're going to deposit or not. So those operate at the very small parts of sizes. So I just put this on graphically uh, for you. And again, you may have seen this. Uh, I'm not sure I have. Um, uh, and at this point, I'm, I'm just going to refer to what the, what's familiar to us, and that's in the micron size particles. So on the, on the uh, very large particles, as I said, a lot of the particles will actually suspend, or probably fall out of suspension even before before they're inhaled. Um, and and uh, so so this is a curve of what what the uh, up to about let's say from about 0.1 micron up to about 100 micron. So the inhalable rates, the particles that we normally are familiar with. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's actually a peak around uh, three, it's around three, three and a half, four microns. Those are the particles that, if you have a, a population of particles, those are the ones that are going to deposit more frequently 
uh, in the lungs themselves. The other ones, the bigger ones are going to get scrubbed off before they reach the lungs. The, the uh, three and a half, four micron particle uh, will deposit because of the impaction and sedimentation. It has both of those uh, operating. And as you go down to the, s to the really small particle, it actually drops off because the particles at, at around one micron, let's say, and just below that size, their their um, particles are too big, too big to be uh, to have uh, to to for diffusion to be very effective, uh, and uh, so so that's the only mechanism at, that operates for those small particles, and they're not in the lungs long enough, and and so so. So for those ones, they they their deposit. That's where the minimum deposition occurs. As you'll see later on, when we talk about nanoparticles, one of our concerns, of course, is that. that um, and I'm not going to. Uh, I'll come back to it later. But uh, uh, that many there's you know the prediction is that most of the nanoparticles will deposit that get into the lungs, and that's that's problematic because we approach 100%, right? Um, so yes, if we can. And this is, of course, I, I'm not, this is a theoretical dose, dose, uh, dose effect uh, curve. I won't spend any of my time on this. I know that this is one you've all seen. I only mention it in this context because it, it wouldn't be right for me not to mention dose uh, because everything that we're talking about here is going to be uh, dose dependent. And, and, and so, so with, as, as we get into the nanoparticle sizes and we predict they're going to deposit, uh, it means that uh, the equivalent amount of nanoparticle uh, in terms of mass would have much, much greater uh, dosage actually deposited. Yes. Okay, so, so this really is kind of the backdrop in the hygiene area. We're saying, uh, and, and looking at the nanoparticles, as, as, uh, as we heard earlier uh, this morning, there's, there's a uh, part of your, uh, there's a course here that on, on, on nanoparticles, and there he is in the, uh, a tremendous uh, interest uh, globally in the whole nanotechnology area. There's, there's a belief that the nanotech is, is the, the new technology um, driver uh, of innovation in, in the future. So there are many, many, uh, many, many countries that are have uh, innovation centers that are working at nanotechnology. And a lot of this has to do with nanomaterials, new new products. Uh, they're all racing to, to uh, try to find new new uh, new designs of nanoparticles, new applications, and so on. But at this stage, um, what, what, we're, what we're finding is that there's still a lot of interest in the, uh, in the and it's uh, still largely experimental in, in, in the nanotech area. It's what I would say it's in the very early stages of commercialization. Uh, we're, we are starting to see products a number of products in, in production facilities, but um, what uh, what um, is is uh, uh, what we're finding is that it's still really early, and, and we uh, we ourselves have been dealing with a few uh, situations, companies where we're looking at uh, some of this. Um, this um, information for them, uh, and we'll probably, I will refer to that again, you know, we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, but uh, I, I still see at this stage, there's a lot of interest, uh, there's, and it's the applications for nanotech are virtually limitless. Uh, here's some examples of the, where we would find the use of nanomaterials and nanotechnology and I'll come back to this first one, cosmetics. The cosmetics industry uh, is actually the biggest user of nanoparticles at the present time, by far. 
uh, and uh, but there is all kinds of new uh, new consumer. I, well, I wouldn't say race cars is a, is a is a is a, is a uh, consumer item, but uh, but uh, it's an example of where they're using nanomaterials or sports equipment. Where there's a whole lot of interest and in, in why why countries uh, and companies are looking at this is in the area of uh, pharmaceuticals and electronics. So my my uh, question, I guess, and interest, and your interest as hygienists, is going to be the question of where are people actually going to be exposed to this? Uh, and so obviously, we would say, well, it's where they make nanoparticles in the nanoparticle uh, nanomaterial production facilities. Right? Yes, that's that's. Um, that's uh, one one area that I think uh, that we we'll, that we need to be aware. of. Probably the bigger one will be in in the manufacturing where people are using them. They're buying the nanomaterials and using them as ingredients. So this would be all the cosmetics, the pharma pharmaceutical industry, the other the other manufacturers that are making all of these golf clubs or you know uh, 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 consumer goods, electronics. So it'll be probably as hygienists we're going to find uh, that this won't be the area, at least in the work environment, where we where we will where we will uh, um, need to concern ourselves about potential exposures. It's I don't think we'll necessarily find ourselves in a in a production facility, but we may very you know find ourselves in this situation here. Uh, and why I mentioned cosmetics again, because not only is uh, it's the biggest uh, user of nano uh, particles right now, but uh, one of the common uh, products, of course, is, is sunblock or skin creams. And uh, as, as hygienists, it's something else that we, we have to be aware of is that one, one of the one of the uh, one of the products that uh, I don't know how to, how often it is used here, but uh, there are all kinds of barrier creams that are, that are sold for for protection of, you know like of the uh, skin. So we have to be aware that this that uh, the nanomaterials can be creeping into a lot of these different products that we would have never thought they were uh, used before. And so that's the dimension of this that both on the consumer side and on an occupational side that we should be aware of and, and start to start to look at. Uh, it, it's one of the areas, for example, that uh, we, were, we were discussing this with, uh, as I said, I was at an allergy conference recently, and that's what we were talking about is in terms of, uh, so far we haven't seen any incidents of allergy from this, but we're, we're not sure. Uh, nobody's been targeting their aim to say, oh, where is this coming from? So I will, somewhere later in the presentation, I will come back to this also. Um, but as consumers, we're likely to see it definitely in, in, in the cosmetics and in the pharmaceuticals. So the medicines that people that, that you go you get a prescription uh, improve, and I have a couple of slides just to help illustrate why the pharmaceutical company would be interested in it's an, in, for improved delivery, improved release of uh, you know slow release drugs, or even distribution, uh, things like that. The uh, rationales behind using uh, nanoparticles in in, in, you know, in medicines or pharmaceuticals. Uh, so, so that's as consumers in the environment. Well, any any of the materials that we manufacture, use, produce uh, with na uh, with nanomaterial ingredients, ultimately will end up somewhere in the waste stream, and that will be in the, in the water or in the soil. Uh, it, and in the water, it may end up in the water because of uh, because of uh, it's actually not from the breakdown, let's say, of, of a, a consumer good, but it could be in the water because of uh, one of the problems we have is the 
people who throw pills uh, in, in, into, the, into the water to dispose of them. So if, if the pharmaceuticals, and of course, it's, you don't have to just throw the pills, they will, they'll be released by the body naturally, uh, by, by our normal, let's say our normal, our normal metabolism, we, we, we will excrete these things out into the, into the water, right? Enough statements. <laughs> yeah, so, so, from me, from me, let's just, I want to just jump into the occupational side here and talk about, uh, about the occupational exposure. And, I, and the first thing we, we think is, okay, the, the places where, there, where nanoparticles are manufactured are going to be places where people will be exposed. Uh, and there are four or five different processes that uh, are used to, to manufacture nanoparticles. And I don't even have to say anything because David can talk about all of that if you have questions for him later. But the more important point that I want to mention to you is that these systems are all closed systems. And so the release of the nanoparticles and the potential for exposure of the workers is, is quite well controlled in those environments. And the reason is, of course, you would be losing all your product if, they, uh, if you didn't have the closed. And the closed is actually necessary in these kinds of processes, condensation or evaporation. You need a closed vessel to retrieve your nanoparticles uh, when, when you're manufacturing them. So, so the, the actual potential or the risks may be not as great as we might fear. In a, in a nano production facility, uh, where uh, where it, my concern will be is in the users of that when they sell the product, pass it over to the, the manufacturing industry, uh, and that's where I think we're going to have to be as hygienists a little bit more uh, alert as to the as to the possibilities. Uh, the other thing that is important is that. Compared to our normal production output, uh, still, even though there's a, um, uh, this kind of intense interest internationally in the manufacture and in the uh, application of nanoparticle technology and nanomaterials, there's still, if we, if we think of the uh, actual production, the, the production is really measured in kilogram amounts as compared to uh, production output uh, in normal manufacturing plants is measured sometimes in kilotons. So, you know, so, so it's it's drastically different. Uh, and that also influences, uh, in, in part, the, the availability is still not there. Uh, but, but um, and, and so, so uh, in a hygiene, we're area we're still not likely to find ourselves dealing with this problem except in specialized situations i don't i haven't uh, i haven't uh, uh, i haven't had any of these experiences david has had lots of them probably so, uh, couple in generating as i said uh, but but uh, where we were what we're dealing with is is that that next year down where the nanomaterials are being provided to some of our um, some of our clients uh, um, who are putting it into their into their products, into their rubber, into their plastic, and and that's where that's where the occupational exposure potential I think is going to be greater for us as hygienists. Um, yeah. So if I, so, I wanted to jump to this one because this is a little bit more actually of the way we have to think about nanoparticles. And this is like in the consumer, in the consumer side. Uh, titanium dioxide is, is probably the most common nanomaterial used. It's certainly one of the most common, it's not the most common. Uh, and here, for example, I've shown you where you might actually 
encounter uh, nanomaterials on a on a on a day to day, you know, a, a, on a real level. I don't know. Do you have these candies here? Do you? Yeah, the gummy bears, right? <laughs> yeah. So the, these new gummy bears, they're 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 brighter, they're clear, they're crisp, right? That's because of this. Na the use of titanium dioxide by titanium dioxide nanomaterial. So, and so it's not that they hadn't used titanium dioxide before, but now the nanomaterial provides this kind of clean, opaque look, right? No nutritional value. Uh, and the same here, this nice, of course, here, here in, in the, in the, Lima, you have fabulous food, right? <laughs> and of course, you have this nice pastry. Uh, but the, you see this this uh, nice nice topping there that's so, so tasty. Well, it's tasty again. It's, it's one of those things that would have uh, titanium dioxide nano nanoparticles. And according to the, to the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., they consider this generally regarded as safe. So it must be because they're putting it in the food we eat, right? <laughs> it's just, as consumers, this is where we're heading, right? So we should be aware of this kind of stuff. So this here is a little bit of a, sorry, what time? I might, okay. I, I, wanna, I wanna make sure that I don't, uh, I don't, I don't uh, run too long, well, right? It's okay. Good. So here for, is an example of the cosmetics industry. And, and as I said, the cosmetics, the cosmetic industry uses all kinds of nanoparticles. And this pie show, uh, is divided into a bunch of little pieces. And these pieces represent the type of nanomaterials that the cosmetic industry uses. And they use that because because of the skin block, and, you know, the UV uh, the UV protection from the sun. Uh, for, you know, it improves the texture or the finish of the cosmetic. There's all there's various reasons why they would add these nanomaterials. But you can see there from this pie chart and the legend on the right side that this includes you know nano nano metals, so silver, gold, a copper, uh, aluminum. And then there's the uh, uh, the uh, fullerenes, which are these big C60 type of uh, compounds, like the fancy one I showed you with uh, with, uh, with, with uh, very intricate structure. <coughs> so, so the cosmetics industry is really the one in the consumer side right now that we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, activity. Here, for example, is in the, in the in the drug industry. This is a this is. <coughs> What they're looking at for for uh, nano nano uh, particles, and they're looking at this is kind of a, a hypothetical example of how a nano material would work uh, to help target uh, to help target the delivery of that medicinal and whatever medicine you have to a specific receptor in the body. So this is kind of a theoretical one that shows using the nano material as a carrier. And this would be for like immune, immune cell targeting. And, and so we, I showed you that there was all kinds of metallic nanoparticles uh, that are used uh, and, and have been designed. There's, these fall into different kinds of, uh, different kinds of uh, particles that, uh, that uh, some of them are, you know, so these, uh, liposomes, and uh, that there's there's a fair amount of uh, work in this area right now in the medicinals. Uh, but again, it's it's a it's a way of delivering the therapeutic uh, the therapeutic drug more effect more effectively uh, and targeting the areas that need it. And so this is why this is why the uh, why the uh, industry is moving there. Now this, now this, okay, so that kind of gives us an idea of just an overview of where we might find uh, nanoparticles, where we might encounter exposures and what we need to be aware of. Uh, now it gets, this gets more to the area that we're interested in as hygienists, and that is what do we, 
what do we know about the toxicology of nanoparticles? Uh, in this this slide, this slide is uh, I'm going to say maybe maybe ten years old. Okay, maybe ten years old, and and I I really haven't changed it because in ten years the toxicology uh, the, the the real information that we have. Uh, is still very limited. We're doing, there's animal research out there, but uh, human human information on exposures, it's really, it's really not, it's really not that clear. We have a little bit more. There's some data on, on these um, particular, on, on the, uh, what they call four rings. There's some on carbon nanotubules. I know David and I have looked at uh, nanofibers. And, uh, um, in, in terms of specifically in terms of uh, toxicology, uh, but for the most part, you see in this kind of it, we're trying to talk about the toxicity. Uh, you know, how does it absorb in the body? How does it distribute in the body? Uh, you know, is there is there is there exposure uh, by other rocks? Uh, oh, a lot of this you see no data, no data, no data. And that's a concern, right? And how do we operate in that kind of a vacuum? So this is, and this, this is why it's important for us to have dialogue around this, uh, to have questions, uh, and and, uh, and this is why we have a session like this. Because for you, you're the you're the future of hygiene. You're the ones that are doing this stuff. Going to be encountering it, right? And so, this is why we want to start right here. Start to start to uh, grab onto this. It's the future. It's the way things are going to be happening. But we're not very well equipped. So that's a, that's 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 the problem that we all have. I, you know, what? I'm I'm at the same place you are. I, I have a little bit more experience, maybe, but. Uh, uh, in, but in reality, I'm, I'm not really happy with this either. So, yeah, so let's say a lot of what we think is going to happen is speculation. Right? Unfortunately, yeah. What we're, and this is, this speculation is mainly driven by, right now, it's fear. What are we, what are we, what are we really concerned about? What is our fear with the nanoparticles? Because, they're specially engineered. They have these unique properties. They can be more reactive, uh, and, and they can they can get to places. They can cross membranes. So what what's what you know what's our concern? Our concern is of course that because they um, because they have all of this uh, surface area that that there's a potential for acute toxicity, more rapid onset. Um, because of it, because of the potential for a higher uh, in interaction and reactions, there's the possibility that we need uh, a lower dose to cause a similar effect. And this is one of the other things that we're concerned about: is that if we were dealing with with micron-sized particles now, you know, a hundred times larger, uh, that uh, surface area is is equally uh, reduced. So. so so at those levels, can we project downwards or backwards? And we think that if we do project backwards, then we will find that, we, that those exposure limits that we set for for, for the chemicals uh, and physical agents, uh, uh, it may be it may be lower than what we think when we're dealing with nanoparticles. Uh, the thing is, of course, depending on the type of particle, there are things like the solubility when it gets into the tissue uh, will be will be another thing. Our concern, in terms of uh, the lungs specifically, is that you know, we've evolved over. I'm not I'm not going to be an evolutionist. I I don't know how long <laughs> it's, that we've evolved for, but our defenses have evolved over that time, right? 
And so our, our body has been trained, our defenses have been trained to recognize particles that are larger particles. How is our defense system prepared uh, to recognize these nanoparticles? And what, what is our uh, immunity, uh, how is our immunity uh, system, uh, immunity and particle uh, clearance, how is that going to work? Uh, so right now we're do, you know there are animal studies looking at this, but it's not it's not as clear. It's not, it doesn't make us happy. We don't know enough. Uh, it, but it, it is part of our concern here that there's going to be unforeseen effects as well. Related to they said some of these have uh, um, the particles. They have different electrical properties, and, and uh, on the on that aspect of them, that means that. Uh, if particles may attach themselves, attach themselves either to each other or attach themselves to, to tissue. Uh, and uh, it, you can do, uh, you can, I remember going back a long time ago, even in, in, in a, uh, if you uh, look at um, the particles that are uh, generated um, mechanically, for example, by, uh, by uh, a grinding wheel or something like that, and you shear the particles, and you Im Im impact a, uh, or you create a charge, a charge on a particle. A charged particle actually will, depo uh, will deposit, uh, there'll be a more deposit of charged particle versus a non-charged particle uh, when it hits the airways, and when it gets into the lungs, because the charged particles, uh, will, uh, they set up a, there's a mechanism, let's just say, a charge effect mechanism, and it will actually enhance that position. So one of our concerns is that at, a, at this nano level, we're going to see something like that as well. But we don't know. Uh, and of course, uh, when we get into these nano sizes, then it's going to be direct, direct, direct disruption of possibility of directly interfering with, with, the, with cell function. Because we're talking about particles now, as I said, that are DNA cells, the particles can, can penetrate cells, so they can interfere at a different level. This is, they, these are some of our fears, right? I'm not saying they're going to happen. I hope they're not going to happen. But, but it is, it is uh, the areas that, that concern us. Um, the, because, the, because the particles are small, uh, where they end up, where they target, uh, where, they, where they navigate into the lungs may differ than the larger particles. That might mean that they're going to, uh, they might, uh, they might move differently. If, if you, if you trap a big particle, for example, in the, in the large airways, uh, the the large airways uh, have a, a clearance ha clearance process elimination uh, is about uh, the half life is about uh, six hours. So if you if you and, and certainly most of the particles that are that are deposited in the in those big airways and then down along the bronchi, not in the gas exchange, but those ones will clear within 24 hours. But but uh, all, they will almost all be cleared within 24 hours. But uh, half of them will be cleared within six. So so um, if you change that balance, it might mean that the particles go deeper. Uh, stay longer, uh, and, and so these are some of our some of our concerns. The other one that I that is maybe we should be really aware of is hygiene. And you're seeing uh, in recent uh, in recent years more interest in skin exposures. And I think uh, I think now that we're seeing that uh, so much of this is driven by the uh, cosmetics industry, we might we might want to pay closer attention to cumulative dose between between the skin exposure and the inhalation exposures. So these are all of, you know these are all the concerns that we're kind of having right now. So this is the other side of that graph I showed you before. I showed you what was happening on the micron size. On the on the ultra fine or the nanoparticle size. Uh, we're, we're, the speculation is that virtually all of the particles are going to be positive. Uh, and um, 
The thing is that um, because they're really small, much smaller than than the nano or than the micron sized particles, all of a sudden the fusion diffusion becomes really, really effective. And so the, the mechanism of diffusion uh, is an important part. Not, not, you're not going to get this uh, uh, impaction or sedimentation unless the particles we're dealing with are bigger. And, and, there's, and therein lies some of the issues that we're trying to sort out in, the, in understanding nanoparticles. Because a lot of the net when you when you have a batch of nanoparticles, a lot of times the individual particles are of course very small, but they're but they're actually uh, delivered in large clumps. So that even though even though or the coagulant, and if it's a big particle, even even though these are all made of small particles individually, the big particle is now going to behave like a micron. And so that will tell us where it's going to deposit. Uh, but it's also causing some problems when we're trying to sort out the toxicology and understand what's happening. Uh, and in part, it's, it's something we need to be aware of because, as I mentioned at the start, uh, with the large particles, they're not going to get very far into lungs. So if we're talking about nanoparticles in the production side uh, or, or uh, as additives, we might find, and we've, we've seen some of the uh, microscopy, that even though the particles themselves, the individual particles are small, that they often are clustered or clumped together. And in that case, uh, what will happen is these things will deposit out in, in, the, uh, in the upper airway. So they're going to get to the back of the throat. They're going to get into the nose. Um, they might get into of the larger airways, but they're not, those big pumps are going to stop there. Uh, in, in the, the one that concern for us uh, is the ones that deposit in the nose, as I mentioned, because that pathway is a bit, you know, up the old, what you call the old factory there. Uh, you know, it, it, it's pretty short. And so, so this is one of the areas that we're talking about, or, or concerned about. Uh, and, um, and as David, you may have questions for him later on as well, but uh, he's the one who's told me that uh, uh, that uh, so depending on one nanoparticle versus another, some of them uh, are charged, uh, and they may actually behave as separate particles when they're released because they repel each other. In, 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 yes, versus other ones that uh, will attract each other and have a tendency to evolve. So all of this kind of dynamic is happening that we are going to have to consider when we look at exposures. Good. So I just wanted to put a little bit on titanium dioxide because I, and specifically, there's, there's, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, I just going to focus on this one point. This is a from a journal of. Uh, of the Journal of uh, Pharm uh, Pharmacology and Bioallied Sciences. It's about five years old, this paper. And um, it's a very good review of, uh, of nanoparticle toxicology. But to summarize, and I wanted to kind of bring it back because I showed you those tasty uh, pastries. And so in terms of titanium dioxide, which is one of the most common nanoparticles, so let me just kind of actually read through this here for you. And it says that whereas the 500, the traditional titanium dioxide added, that is about 500 nanometers, or about a half a micron. Okay? Uh, and whereas these particles of that size have only a small, a very small uh, ability to cause DNA strands to break. These new 20 nanometer particles that they're adding uh, are capable of causing complete, complete destruction of DNA, even at low doses. Uh, and 
this is and in this case, in the absence of you needing to clean up there, that's to, to clean the laundry. Um, so this is a very this is a this is a, 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 a really important thing to keep in mind. The other that, that uh, as I say, there's not a whole lot in the uh, human toxicology area yet, but in, from my animal studies, one of the things we're worried about is carbon nanotubules are again another one of those very common ones. Concerned, it's been shown that they can kill uh, kidney cells and inhibit cell growth. So that's those. Those are the two that uh, that we're that we're um, uh, you know examples of wh where we have a little bit more information. Uh, but just to summarize this, most of most of what we understood before was based on our understanding of the toxicology. Uh, and what was going to happen was based on okay, where does it, where do these, where do particles, any respirable inhalable particle, where does it deposit in the lungs? Because that will determine how it leaves them, how it's cleared from them, and how, how effective it is. With nanoparticles, now we've added a whole two other things that we have to be concerned about. And one of those is the ability for these particles to actually go across, they have to easily go across into the circulation, travel around the body, a deposit in organs. Um, and the other one is, is the reactivity of these particles because they're they're so tiny and because they're engineered. Okay, so we are actually getting we are actually getting very close to the end, okay? But uh, and I only throw this in here. Uh, be, because uh, uh, there's, I think most hygiene presentations would be incomplete without talking about air sampling. Uh, so let's talk about air sampling. Uh, and, and so there's actually, uh, in terms of air sampling, uh, um, one of the one of the there is a there's a particle counter out there that is I don't know if you I don't know if you have any of these here or if you use them yet. So these are these condensation particle counters, and the way they work, of course, is to grow the particle so that it's big enough and, and can be uh, recognized. Uh, but uh, uh, the other one is to trap the particles, trap the particles, and analyze them by traditional methods. So the traditional methods are are uh, are very straightforward as well. Uh, of analysis, so so electron microscopy. Uh, in, in those advanced analytical techniques, perfectly suitable for, for nanoparticles. It, it's just that we, we need to make sure that we can capture them. This, this is actually uh, just a simple, uh, very simple, ordinary cassette, ordinary uh, sampling cassette uh, that we put in a little, it's almost like your asbestos cassette, where you have a, 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 a larger um, piece in the middle, but, and, and, uh, and it has two, let's say, two filters on it. And we used this uh, previously to, to, uh, to trap uh, particles that were produced by condensation. And, and so, so in this particular case, all that happens is you're giving a little bit, you're, you're slowing down the, you're slowing down the uh, air, uh, maybe trapping some on the first filter, giving it some time until it hits the second filter. Uh, in, in which you capture, and then of course once it's on the filter, then you look at it with uh, with uh, traditional um, analytical methods. So uh, on that end, we're not finding, we're not, you know, we won't be challenged as hygienists to be able to. If the, we haven't, uh, let's say, we can do it. We can do it. Are there standard methods that are being used yet? They're, they're not. There's. They're not out there yet, there's not um, a little manual that says do it this way, but uh, there are, those are just two examples. There's a few other methods to do these uh, ultra-fine particles. It's the same stuff we've been doing in, uh, for for uh, capturing uh, air pollutants uh, from, uh, you know, uh, urban traffic and things like that. So on the sampling side, we, we, have, the, we have the capabilities, and the analy analytical side, we have the capabilities. Where we're going to, you know, where we're, we are kind of handcuffed right now as hygienists in this talks area in trying to make informed interpretation, right? 
that's where I'll drop this one. Yes, okay. Um, and I think this is actually the final slide, I'm not sure. But, uh, uh, so we talked a bit about exposure, uh, exposures, and as I said, I'm thinking that as hygienists, it's, it's not going to be in production facilities. That's not where we're, where as hygienists, we're going to, the hygienists that work there, of course, are going to, but for most of us, we're not going to find ourselves there. It's going to be somewhere down, downstream of that that we're going to find ourselves. Uh, also as consumers, and that's going to be the other area. Um, the traditional ways that we control uh, dust, same thing, Work, works fine, uh, for nanoparticles. Uh, in fact, some of the nanoparticles are probably going to be easier because uh, um, it's like it's like um, you're approaching the size of uh, uh, yeah uh, of gas molecules, right? So now, uh, so now uh, that means that uh, these things will these things will be a little bit easier and faster in closed systems. So, so I think we don't have to concern ourselves that much about this side. We can apply traditional methods here, and the same with PPE. The traditional PPE will work for this as well. Um, the one thing we probably, there's two things that we are, are still a little bit uncertain. We've done a little bit of testing on this, and that is whether you're going to get particles penetrating through the, through, uh, the protective clothing. Um, because if that does, then you would, now you would have to consider that as a skin exposure, and whether the skin exposure is going to be significant. Not sure. And it will depend on what particle we're talking about. Uh, the other thing, of course, is as you get down to real fine particles, it's a, explosivity is a is a real possibility. So we have to we have to concern ourselves about how we handle nanoparticles from that side. And I think yes. So I think that's sorry. I, I ran a few minutes uh, over, but. Uh, uh, Anyways, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I suspect, I suspect that um, what will happen is those wastes will be, will be treated as non-hazardous waste. I'm not saying that they're not, but uh, the, the waste may be diluted sufficiently to the point that it will be considered non-hazardous waste. And that, that is actually a really key criterion uh, in terms of, uh, also in terms of formulations, because uh, you will find, for example, if, if you look at a chemical data sheet, there will be no requirement, uh, at least at the present time, uh, there won't, you won't see nanomaterial unless it's above 0.1% uh, or above 1%. So that's going to be a def defining criterion about the, the, the hazardous, uh, on the other end as well, on, the, on the how you handle the waste. Um, 
the, the problem I, I think will be is, is that those wastes are going to be widespread and who's going to be responsible for them. Um, in, 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 a, in a particular, in an industrial process, if you can capture them and, and accumulate them, um, I suspect that what they would be doing is, is actually reusing them because they're, they're expensive and they're in small quantities. So um, the amount of actual waste that you're expecting right now, uh, you're avoiding that to the extent possible. Uh, it's very costly. I don't know if that's helpful at all or not. And that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Actualmente usamos actualmente usamos eh, para protegernos del sol lo que da solar que contiene en el 99% de las cremas comerciales dióxido de titanio como usted ha explicado ¿cuál sería la exposición que tenemos eh, como usuarios en, en ese momento? ¿sería en forma dérmica? yo creo que sí pero también esas partículas, esas nanopartículas, ¿la podríamos inhalar en esa forma dérmica al momento de que se seque el, el bloqueador? Uh, so according to the, uh, the FDA, the Food and Drug people, they have cleared this product, they say it's okay, it's safe. Um, the, the um, review article that I referred to suggests as well that it, um, the, the titan, use of the titanium dioxide is safe. And that's at this, at this time, right? Um, we know as hygienists that we continue to research and then we find something new. So, so from so the dermal exposure, I'm still uncertain about. I, I, I'm not sure. We know the nanoparticles can easily penetrate across the across the uh, uh, dermal membrane, uh, but. You uh, mentioned whether the dermal, whether there's going to be an inhalational exposure associated with that. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And and I don't, I don't uh, I believe that the nanoparticle would be trapped in the in the in the in the um, uh, in the um, matrix of the cream. So I don't see an necessarily an inhalational component, but uh, where that is if it's a cream. Now we are also finding that people are using sprays, right? Uh, and I, I have more of a concern about aerosols. And in that case, I, I, I would be more concerned for sure. Yeah. It, overall, uh, use of sprays and aerosols just puts things in the air, and then if it's you know they stay in the air for a while, and then you're walking in this cloud. And usually it might be in your bathroom, you know, and and so now it's it's closed, closed room. So you now you've got a kind of a little exposure chamber, <laughs> and and you're going to be breathing that in and out, and maybe you're going to do your hair, and you know, so so then you're in there 10, 15 minutes. That's that's where uh, that's where I would say I would have more concern. So it's a it's a it's a very good point that you raised that you can you know the application of it. Um, in both cases, you get the cream or the or the uh, sprays. Mm. <laughs> now I don't know whether they're using them for hairspray. So <laughs> that would be my. Yeah. Yes. Uh, One sec. <laughs> 
Usted me mencionó, gracias por la exposición, usted mencionó que eh, las nanopartículas, por ejemplo, justo lo que comentó mi compañero, ese tipo de nanopartícula no produce ningún daño a la salud, o, o bueno, al menos la FDA está diciendo que es segura hasta ahora. ¿Conoce de tres o cuatro ejemplos de nanopartículas que sean realmente peligrosas? Algo así como nosotros sabemos que sílice cristalino es realmente peligroso en nanopartículas. ¿Hay alguna que sea así? ¿Tres o cuatro que se le vengan a la cabeza? Gracias. You're talking about specific product? Oh, okay. Uh, that really is, I'm, I'm not saying that, 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 that they're safe. I'm not saying that they're safe, no. Uh, I, but I am saying that, um, that the few studies that are out there on titanium dioxide in that review article mentioned that, uh, that they were safe for consumption. But we have animal studies that are contradicting it. In, in, in terms of real, real hazard, we, we look at a couple of uh, situations where uh, we've looked at nanotubules and nanofibers uh, on, in products in, to evaluate their toxicity by looking at, at their structure and, and uh, reviewing the kind of the literature behind it. Um, and it's really inconclusive. Uh, the, it's, the, the, um, the problem that, that uh, I see is, uh, is, in the, is in the usage, it's how it's used. Uh, and, and that's going to be uh, defining Whether, whether, whether there's going to be issues or not. What, what we found is that the, the, the nanofibers and nanotubules that we've looked at, uh, they're, again, you know, they're these tiny particles, but they're often, they're clumped together. Uh, and so now if they're clumped together, they're behaving differently. They're behaving like a bigger particle. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can say with any certainty when they get inside the body that they're either going to stay like that or they're going to fall apart. And if they fall apart, then... So, so to be able to say for sure, and we're, I think we're, we're driven by caution right now. Um, there, there are certainly, there's certainly, the evidence is more on the unsafe than the safe side from the little bit of information that we have, that we can show toxic effect. Um, but uh, nano, nano silicon, do okay, you know? Yeah. 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 Those are the, what I would say. Yeah, the, 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 the most of the toxicity stuff that is, is only based on two or three of the products right now. And all of these ones that are being used, they're all custom made, custom built for one purpose. And so, uh, and, and, and the science behind it, 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 it's not really being done. I, I don't know how many of you uh, are, uh, look closely at the chemical data sheets. Uh, but uh, it, the chemical data sheets are supposed to disclose what the hazards of the product are, right? Uh, but in reality, a lot of that stuff is uh, written by, uh, by software. And, and so they go down the list and they say, okay, this ingredient, this ingredient, this ingredient. And then they, they, they take the information from the manufacturer of that ingredient, put it into the data sheet, but they don't test the product. And the product is more than the sum of its ingredients. And so, uh, so our our problem is getting that information because there are so many different variations of this, and the reading, the testing hasn't been done. So I I, I can't tell you that uh, that uh, 
Yeah, that uh, that the, the na this is the specifically nasty one or that one. There, there is the, a group of, uh, of nanoparticles called the C carbon sixty fullerenes, and there is some information on them that is showing, uh, uh, um, referring to their car carcinogenic potential, able to cause cancer. So that's probably. Really, the kind of the status right now. It still hasn't been really resolved. I, I know David and I fairly recently were looking at uh, some of the Fox literature, and it's still, yeah. I wish, I, you know, I really wish I could say yeah, because that's where I want to be too. With all of you to say, oh, I got some comfort now, right? But it's not, it's not there. But that's a very good, very good question. Yeah. Thank you. acerca de que actualmente en las industrias manufactureras, cuidar el hogar, se usan las enzimas. Una de las partículas que se enzima es la subtilicina. Mi pregunta era si esas partículas dentro del límite figura con como 60, grados, 60 nanogramos por metro cúbico, es un límite bastante bajo. Actualmente es considerado, tiene relación con la nanotecnología, con lo que se ha visto actualmente, y cómo deberíamos proteger ante esa situación, ¿no? Let's see if I understand the question. Uh, so, you're saying that when you're using the enzymes that there's a 60 nanogram uh, limit. 60 nanogram per, 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 per what unit? Per, 60 nanograms per, per cubic meter per liter per meter cube okay and, but that limit where does it come from the limit for 60 nanograms how, how was that established is that a manufacturer's limit is that a, is that a, an internal guideline do you know Yes. Okay. Right. So that's 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 a measure of dose. That's a measure of dose, but it may not relate in any way to the actual size of the of the uh, material. Right. It's just it's just that that what that's a fairly low limit, uh, and 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 so we're using instead of a. Uh, milligrams per meter cube or micrograms per meter cube now we're down you know to the nanograms per meter cube but that just simply means that that is very restrictive and so the amount of you know permissible dosage is very low but that that doesn't necessarily imply that uh, the, the material itself is in the nanogram sizes okay is that is that helpful? 